on board and on board. Brothers and sisters, can all of you see Shirley Chisholm? Can you see her? Who are you for for president? Shirley Chisholm! We walk together down an important street. That street was Constitution Avenue. And only 27% of the 52% of the American people voted for our president. America has gone to sleep. Collective talents and abilities should be utilized by all of us in order to try and help make this world a better place in which to live. I love that introduction. Hi, 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 hi. I'm Chelsea D. I'm your moderator this evening, and I'm also a co curator and associate producer at the National Black Theater. This is the NBT at Home Conversation Series Unbought and Unbossed Reclaiming Our Vote. Uh, and this is part two. Catch us next week for our, well, not next week, but October 29th for our final conversation, part three. These conversations are happening in tandem with the release of our digital commission series. This is a series of public service announcements coming at you from black women artists, letting you know what's really going on, what the truth is, and what we need to be doing in this election season. Those are coming at you every Wednesday. So check out our Instagram, our Facebook, and website to catch those. Last week, we released My Right to Voice, My Right to Vote by Mahogany L. Brown. Check that out. Uh, and this week, we've just released Nguzi Anyanwu's You're Going to Be Okay. So check both of those out. Um, really inspirational stuff. And we have, we have so many more lined up and so many that have been released. So dig into that. This series is in partnership with Michelle Obama's When We All Vote. This is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is on a mission to increase participation in every election and close the race and age voting gap. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to welcome this evening's guests, two of this evening's guests, uh, and we will be joined by a third special guest later this evening. But I would like for everyone to give a digital snap snap round of applause Welcome, welcome, welcome to our guests, Stephanie L. Young and Rhonda Ross. Woody woot, woot, woot. <laughs> uh, so we're going to get into right now, um, letting the folks know who you are, what you are, are what you are about. <laughs> I know that seems like a big question. What are you about? What is your whole mission in life? Um, no, <laughs> but just get to know you a little bit um, with our check-in, with our check-in questions. Uh, so today, I'd like you to give us your name, your pronoun, and your accessibility. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, your art form, what you do, um, and when, why, how did the political become personal for you? And the final question is, what does it mean to you to be unbought and unbossed, politically or personally, or both? Uh, let's see, Rhonda Ross, do you want to start us off? <laughs> Uh, yes, hi Chelsea. It's so good to see you. Um, happy to be here. Um, those were a lot of questions. I know. So I'm going to answer them all. That might be our whole time. So maybe we'll go back and forth. And, and yes, yeah. I'll go back and forth. Uh, I'm Rhonda Ross. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm I'm uh, out in Los Angeles right now, though I live in New York. I am. Um, a storyteller at heart. Most of my stories come through song, but many of them also come through prose and poetry and uh, and theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I am in the process of doing everything I can uh, to to empower myself, mm -hmm. to calm myself. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, during this during this time to keep my my eye uh, keep my eye on the prize, and I like to say keep my eye on the whys, uh, wow. why why I'm here, why I'm doing what I do, why I want uh, um, a different world. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, a different, a different, a different way of being than we've had. Um, why I want to vote. Um, why I want to get everyone else to vote. Um, so I keep my eye on the whys. And um, in my my work, uh, I do that personally, and I'm doing that now. So if I'm a little distracted, that's where my head is. Uh, but at the same time, I do that in my storytelling, in my music, in my poetry. That's what I do. I, I hope that my work empowers uh, and, and, and leads people to, uh, to a sense of, of deep self-understanding and self-love. I mean, I feel like you're living in a place of being unbought and unbossed. Oh, and I didn't even answer that question yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the last one. You were knocking I, them out, though. I got <laughs> one more to say. You want me to keep going or should we? Well, back? You, yeah, well, just answer for us. Like, what does it mean to you to be unbought and unbossed? This famous so, um, phrase from Shirley Chisholm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I love that you I love that you asked that. And I love that you mm -hmm. all are creating um, this whole program around it because I hadn't, I had thought about it, but I hadn't really thought about it. So, um, so, so, so in prep for this, I've always said unbought and unbossed, unbought and unbossed, like as if it's a one thing. But when I looked at it, it really is two separate uh, issues. And, uh, and what I see is, is unbought has to do with um, someone, uh, I, I saw a lot of carrot and stick. Right. Uh -huh. I saw a lot of good cop, bad cop. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of um, 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 uh, strategies that use both the flattery of you, the compliment mm -hmm. of you, the gift giving of you, the money mm -hmm. giving, you, the bribery of you, mm -hmm. um, what they want you to do or the threatening. Mm -hmm. The extortion, the pain, the um, uh, the the harm, you, the intimidation mm -hmm. of you um, to get you to do so. To be unbought and unbossed is this is this straight and narrow between that where mm. you keep your eye on the on the wise on the prize where you're focused where your your focus is unconditional mm. neither side of neither side can 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 um can deter you right uh, so that's that's what it means to me and that's what I'm what I'm trying to do and what I'm hoping we as as a people will do keep our mm. eyes don't let the distractions on one side or the other mm. um, de deter us or distract us right oh, i so appreciate that i so appreciate that because you know and that's one of the goals i think with this conversation series for me personally is like where is the clarity where can how can we see through this historical moment because these things you know we have been in situations like this prior and we have found our way through to this this present so moment now. See, there's so many things happening mm -hmm. on so many levels that can take your breath away at, at a moment's notice, that can keep mm -hmm. you up at night, that can, you know, um, take all your, your patience, all of your, you know, like mm -hmm. everything. And there's so much going on that I think we have to just keep getting present, getting focused, you know, staying clear about mm -hmm. our healing and our own uh, uh, oh. balance um, and for me and that's why I'm looking forward to hearing uh, so much of what Stephanie has to say for me getting informed is a huge part of that mm -hmm. a huge part of that because there's so much coming at you you don't know how much of what's real what's not real what's biased what you know you got to get you got to get informed you got to get educated mm -hmm. um, and and that helps you become um, unbossed and unbought, right? That, yeah. that idea of educated, that you know what you know. Mm -hmm. You know what you know, yeah. You know the whys. I love that, I love that. Keep keep the eyes on the whys, whys, gotta get that. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie yeah. L. Young, so excited to have you here. Hi. <laughs> uh, let's check in, let's check in. And just, yeah. If you need a re uh, reminder, just let me know. Um, I'll pepper you with questions. No, luckily you guys have in this chat. Oh, there so you go. I, will, I will glance over. I feel like I should have gone before Rhonda, okay? Because that was amazing. So let me let me try to keep up. <laughs> but 
Uh, my name is Stephanie Young. Uh, I go by she and her. Uh, it's my pronouns. I'm currently in Atlanta. Uh, I do live in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, but I'm home in Atlanta. I've been here since quarantine started with my family. Um, okay, the next question is who I am, what my art form is. I am a communicator. Um, I uh, work very hard to make sure that um, through my work as a political communicator, I can be potentially a culture shifter uh, mm -hmm. and I can give people the tools and resources that they need to empower them uh, to use their voices in a multitude of ways, be that become more civic engaged, be that just become more informed, be better citizens, uh, mm -hmm. vote in each and every election. I am passionate about the intersection of culture and politics uh, because they both influence, influence each other. I think we can see that even mm -hmm. more now. Uh, so it is so incredibly important for these types of conversations to happen with these creative minds and beings because you have so much power uh, to shift culture, to tell stories, to inform mm -hmm. people in ways um, that are not just creative, but can really spur people to action. And I really hope that moving forward, we can continue this open dialogue because um, our government, our, our politics won't, won't survive if there's not this partnership, I think, with mm -hmm. the art wor world um, holistically. Um, when, why, how, and who, <laughs> we kind of became <laughs> political in my family, or not in my family, but in my life, I'll say this. I became political probably when I didn't even realize it. I was eight years old when I lived in Cape Town, South Africa uh, in 1992 to 1996. So I got to experience the transition from apartheid to democracy. I got to see wow. President Nelson Mandela be elected. I got to see my parents uh, hold voter registration and education drives uh, in wow. South Africa all over the country through our denomination, the AME Church, um, where my father served as a bishop there for those four incredible years. And that has imparted so much on my life and um, has given me a sense of responsibility to use my gifts and my talents um, to help move this culture forward in every way possible that I can. I have worked forever in politics, but again, I can't tell you how much I'm in love with theater. I'm in love with culture. I'm in love with the arts. Um, and I see the great need for, again, that marriage there. Um, so it's always been personal for me uh, to live out um, my ideas and my ideals of who this country can be and use who I am to help um, make it better. And um, and bought and embossed. Um, you know, Rhonda, she covered, she covered a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> and I agree with pretty much everything she said. <laughs> I'm gonna hone in on one 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 thing she she mentioned, which was staying focused. When I think mm. about being a bot, it is staying focused. We have been thrown um, into the ringer um, beyond just the misinformation that we get uh, continuously um, from a multitude of different platforms. Um, mm. We have been in complete and utter chaos and it is so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to get depressed. It's mm -hmm. so to, to lose focus and to lose hope. And that's a part of the plan. Um, mm. And I think that we have to remember um, mm. as foreign citizens that it's so important for us to stay focused because the moment we take our eye off the ball, which we have, um, we end up in situations that we don't recognize. So I, when I think about Unbot, I think about staying focused. Um, and unbossed, I think about our power as women. Um, mm. I think about the recent debate with Senator Harris and um, uh, Vice President Pence, and when she had to say, I am speaking. Um, mm. About sitting at tables every day where I have to say that or getting on a Zoom call now, we don't go to meetings, but getting on a Zoom call and people say, am I only talking to you? Yes, you're only talking to me. Um, and that's okay, because I do some things too. So I think about being unbossed in that way of standing up in our power as women, as black women, um, mm. and not being afraid uh, to speak up and to show the world who exactly we are. So glad wow. to be here with you both today. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm so glad you bring up uh, South Africa as well, because that was actually um, studying their history was one of the first times I realized art can be used as a social tool. It's not yeah. just um, an elitist practice that only a few people get to engage in and, uh, and only enhances a certain demographic's life. Like, no, that art theater was being used to talk about things to address the, to keep people focused you know to keep people clear about this is this is this is the the creation of a new nation here which is you know really exciting to be in this election season and thinking about that again yes please i, I remember seeing seraphina 
I, I probably was four or five, but saw that in the theater, yeah. actually here in Atlanta. Um, so I, I still remember faintly, right? I remember that moment. Um, and when we moved there, my sister thought I was going to have to go to a school like Serafina, which I did not have to do that. Um, uh -huh. but it was, but you're right. Like that, that movement, um, mm -hmm. really permeated American culture and popular mm -hmm. culture in a way that I don't think other movements did. Um, you know, we knew obviously the movement in the sixties was huge, right? Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of artists, um, as we know, were a part of that movement, but the way in which um, the anti-apartheid movement really was in the culture was on a different world. It was, you know, there, yes, was yes. play. there were so many different things that people tapped into and were creative about, so yeah. And Rhonda, do you, can you talk to us a little bit about your work for 100 Years, 100 Women in, in partnership with NBT? Because this is such, sometimes I think, oh, I'm just an actor, I'm just a writer, you know, and I'm just involving myself in, in, in these things and tra la la. But, you know, I really appreciate, Stephanie, you highlighting the relationship between culture and between and, and politics and society and how all of these things are so intermeshed. So, Rhonda, do you want to talk to us a little about what you did for 100 Years, 100 Women, and how do you see your storytelling in all of the ways that you, you mentioned how you can, can convey a story? How do you see that as part of your civic engagement, like a part of how you are opening the door for people to become involved and, and yourself as well? Yeah. Thank you. That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, that's really an important. It's such an important question. I think, especially for we artists, yes. uh, because we have a tendency to feel like if we're not, um, if we're not uh, on the front lines in a very literal way, that somehow the art that we're doing may not be making a difference. And but I know that it is making a difference, and it's and it's something I think about a lot. So mm -hmm. so. Um, so let me start with what my work is, is I like to, I like to take difficult, um, sharp emotions and situations and thoughts and feelings and, and put them into, uh, into words in such a way that, um, uh, that I, and hopefully the listener of my song or whatever can untangle them. Ooh. Right pull them apart, see them for what they are, uh, not be so afraid of them. And when you're not so afraid of them, you can sit in their presence and 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 they they are de-escalated and, mm -hmm. and you can heal. And I believe that it's that healing that leads to all of the other things that we're wanting, all the other things that we're mm -hmm. fighting for, going for, hoping for, dreaming for. Um, it starts with a personal healing where once you're healed and you love yourself and you know your value, you know that you matter, you do not accept a certain uh, uh, um, a certain situation, right. certain treatment, certain whatever, that it comes from it comes from inside. And I mean, we we've seen that in many. We're seeing that now. We're seeing that now with the with the movement for Black Lives, and that we're seeing that we've seen it in the '60s. We saw it in South Africa. We've seen say, "No, I'm worthy of more than this because I I know my value." So my work as an artist, I believe, starts in that space where I I help to untangle those those things so we can we each can know our value and 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 know that we matter. So in terms of a hundred years, a hundred. Uh, uh, women, um, the the call to me um, from National Black Theater was to make a piece. I think I was told uh, it's, it's the anniversary of the 19th Amendment um, where women got the right to vote, make a piece. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I'm on quarantine. <laughs> I'm a performing artist where I'm quarantined away from anybody I would perform with, including my husband. I wasn't even with him and he plays piano, but I wasn't even with him. And so I thought, how, and I, so how am I going to make a piece? How am I going to, you know, make a piece? I, okay. So, <laughs> so, I, so I started, um, started really asking myself, not so much what I was going to make, but again, why I was going to make it. And what was I stumbling over? What was I choking on that was making this feel so difficult? And, um, 
it took me weeks of asking that question over and over and over again um, and looking at it and untangling it as I just as I just described. And what I realized was that I don't have a big connection to the 19th Amendment. Hmm. <laughs> Huh, That's interesting. <laughs> and there was this feeling of, yes, I'm supposed to make this this piece about, you know, and I thought, no, I don't, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, why don't I feel that? Mm -hmm. And I started doing that um, research, both personally asking myself those questions, why don't I feel connected to the 19th Amendment? And then actual academic research. And then I was like, oh, right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's one for me and mm -hmm. so and um and so so mm. this it, it was this qu these questions of intersectionality these questions of of what it is to live on 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 the crossroads of of race and gender and and um and and all of these things and so i made a piece that was just asking that that was just exploring that it didn't it didn't answer it it didn't um come up with any kind of decision about should the 19th amendment mean something to me? Should it not? Should, you know, mm -hmm. am I black first? Am I female first? Am I, uh, 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 it just mm -hmm. explored all of those feelings, mm -hmm. all of the feelings of, of, of all those questions. And, um, uh, and just on a, on a, on a more logistic personal note, um, I had, I, created, like I said, it was on my mind, on my mind. I created a piece. I had to do a video piece and that was um, unfamiliar to me. Cause like I said, mm -hmm. I'm a performing artist. And so, but I created a, a piece and I was, I was thrilled with it. I, I used uh, Abby Lincoln, uh, who is one of my mentors um, mm -hmm. as my inspiration. And I used Abby Lincoln and I had, uh, you know, black activists all thrown in there and they mm -hmm. were photos and video that I didn't own the rights to. And so about three days before it was due, I said to myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not kidding. Like two days before it was due. I was wow. like, you know what? I don't have the rights to this stuff. I don't, think I, I don't think I can use it. So I literally revamped the entire project um, about two days before it was due. And, um, and because I had to use things that I had the rights to, I had taken all these selfies throughout the quarantine. And so I used these selfies. And then I said, well, if I'm using these selfies, this is like a self portrait. Well, that makes sense because I'm talking about the intersectionality that I'm exploring being, you know, between race and gender. And so I made it a self portrait. I changed the whole thing about 48 hours before. And I was really pleased with what came out, but it wouldn't have come out had I not had all those iterations of it. Um, yes, and the untangling. And the untangling that, of it. that yeah. you went through personally for your process to make yeah. that. Yeah. And I feel civically engaged with what you're <laughs> with what you're bringing up about the centennial of the 19th Amendment. I mean, a hundred years since the yeah. ratification of the 19th Amendment and black women. And as I learned um, through, there was an entire commission that was created to like really celebrate this and get people informed about it. Mm -hmm. But there were so many women of color who were so active in getting women the right to vote. And then, you know, not being able to enjoy that right for many, is that, is that, is Ida. that, is that Mama Ida? Ida. That's Mama Ida. <laughs> That's Mama Ida. So during, during my work for that piece, I started just gravitating uh -huh grabbing all of this information and yes yeah, she came up she came up so strongly for me and so you know, I, I you know I had I had that knowledge of her but I just I became insatiable and yeah. uh, and you know I googled and YouTube and all that but then I grabbed this book this is excellent by the way <laughs> passion okay. passionate for justice that's this yeah excellent right. excellent book excellent. yeah uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I I got really, um, you know, engaged. Yeah, I, you know what I mean. You get turned on to these things, and then you're like, well, how can I separate the two? Like, how can I, after you know, really studying um, South Africa, I'm like, well, how can I ever really divorce my art from my social justice advocacy? How can I ever really, how can I ever really say that those two things are not linked and are not so meaningful to me and why and my why my why you know so intimately linked to that uh okay let's uh let's let's shift <laughs> that's really rich though i i have i have so many quotes i'm writing down stuff <laughs> everybody's saying 
Um, so anywho, today's topic, we're talking about Stacey Yvonne Abrams, who ran for the governorship of Georgia in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and came up against um, a lot of pushback from the from the. She was running against somebody who was also officiating the election, right. and there was lots of legal battles around, you know, just getting getting the, getting the the vote count right and making sure that everyone's vote was being counted and, and everybody's will the will is being represented of the people. Um, and so I remember following this case and thinking. Wow, it's 2000 at the time, 2018, and this is like voter suppression, like mm -hmm. 60s level. And at the time, I didn't even realize there have been other eras, you know, where voter suppression was like <sighs> huge, huge, um, hugely a part of the culture, hugely steeped in what we were doing. So, so this experience of Stacey Abrams made me think when um, NBT was like, we want to talk about Black women and, and politics, and we want to we want to highlight the contemporary and the historical, I thought this would be a really great time to talk about her struggle and how she used that struggle in Georgia to, to open up a much bigger conversation about the history of voter suppression in, in America um, and what we can do today to actively um, engage with that and to actively make sure that we are asserting our citizenship. You know, um, She has a wonderful story, just as a quick sidebar, um, about getting the message implicitly from her interaction with the security guard somewhere that she doesn't belong here, you know? And there's a lot of, I think, messaging that we get around not belonging, around not, you don't, you shouldn't feel comfortable having the access to the power that your vote gives you. And you don't need to um, use that power, you know what I mean? And so her story is something that really, really made me start to think about how can we see ourselves as active change agents? How can we see ourselves as people who are co-collaborating and building, building a new world? So here's a quote from Stacy that I think will start us off in the next half of our conversation. Stacy just did an interview with NPR about a documentary that was just released called All In. Um, I might be getting the rest of the title. No, that's that right. That's her. It's All In. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's just tracking how voter suppression has been a part of the history of this country. And this is these tactics and the desire to suppress the vote is not new. Um, it's just kind of changing tactics. Um, and so in, a, in an interview with NPR, Abrams says, we should not live in a nation where your access to democracy depends on your celebrity, your wealth, or your zip code. And I think this is this is a quote that is just in the vein of a Shirley Chisholm. Stacy is stating very clearly this is what you're dealing with. You know, when your democracy comes down to zip code, wealth, celebrity, you know, what what's going on? What how how are we really going to engage with this? So to Stephanie, the first uh, oh yeah yeah great 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 pulling that up. Nia Nia is always behind the scenes doing the banner magic. Okay, peep the banners. Uh, audience question: Let us know in the chat uh, what it, what is voter suppression? How do you define it? Where are you seeing it? And Stephanie, could you talk to us a bit about what are what are some tactics we're seeing around voter suppression this election season specifically? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think it's important just to give a little bit of historical context in the yeah. documentary that you mentioned that Stacey did, and she was a producer of it, really was about her story, will also give you that. So I encourage everybody listening to watch a documentary. Also, make sure you watch Slay the Dragon on Hulu. It is excellent. It talks about voter su suppression, but it also talks about gerrymandering, which I know people probably hear and they, they might pretend like they know, but they mm -hmm. probably don't really mm -hmm. know. This is an opportunity for everybody to get more informed um, about how critical and important that issue is, especially I think today is the last day around the census and the census and gerrymandering and voter suppression are all. Oh, yes. So if you have not done the census, please make sure you do the census. But 
you you mentioned that you know voting um, was not for anybody in this country but white landowning men. Yeah. Um, and in about I think it was around 1787 when white landowners in the South uh, were outnumbered by enslaved um, people of color, black people. Um, they weren't on par with their northern counterparts. And that's when they said, well, look, we need some more numbers on our side to help us out. So what do they do? They made African-Americans three fifths of human beings. Um, mm -hmm. Said that we, if we put a couple of them together, then there'll be a whole human and I'll have more people that I'm representing. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, I'll have more power, more numbers, a bigger yeah. kind of um, electoral kind of college opportunity um, mm. in Congress. And that's that was the birth of the electoral college. That's that's why the system is old, it's antiquated. It needs to probably be done with. Um, mm. But that is for another conversation. <laughs> another fight. Um, so you're right. Nothing that we're seeing, nothing that we're experiencing is new at all. Yeah. Nothing. Um, and what's so critically important uh, is to remember uh, that there right now is nothing new under the sun and that we have to make sure that we are knowledgeable to what voter suppression actually looks like and that we know our rights so that we're not intimidated. And I think that, you know, especially for, for us black women, we should just talk to our, our parents, talk to our grandparents if they're still in our lives, talk to them about their voting experiences. Um, and we've only had a very short life of, uh, of, of a strong and equal right access to the ballot box. Um, it hasn't been that long. So the Voting Rights Act, um, which John Lewis helped to push an author was gutted in 2013 mm -hmm. um, during President Obama's second term. And what that did was take away certain provisions uh, and protections really for people in states that had a history of voter suppression. So states like mm -hmm. Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Texas, North Carolina. And then the moment that the, those protections were taken away, these state legislatures that were mm -hmm. all stacked in a different type of political direction decided to put in all of these draconian and really crazy rules and laws from mm -hmm. strict voter ID laws um, to strict laws around voting by mail to mm -hmm. the way that you actually get registered to vote. There are 13 states in 2020 that will not allow you to register to vote online. That makes absolutely no sense. So mm -hmm. right there, you're already taking young people. Right? Yeah, right. And many, many other people out of the process. Um, mm -hmm. So, voter suppression looks, it looks, it doesn't look different, but every state, I think, has its own little form, unfortunately. There's some wow. amazing states that work super hard to ensure that voters have equal access to the ballot box, like California, like um, mm -hmm. Oregon, um, even Utah, and other places like that mm -hmm. have done a really exceptional job to, to, with making sure that. There's not as many barriers to the polls. What we know, um, you know, right now is that there's been really big voter voter uh, pu uh, purges of the list mm -hmm. of who vote. So let's just say you haven't voted in two or three years, um, or maybe even four years, and they may say, okay, well, this person hasn't voted for this long, so we'll we'll, we'll take them out of the we'll take them off of the rolls, and then right. when they go to vote, okay, because they think they can. Uh, then they won't be able to, and they would have missed a deadline. Um, mm -hmm. So all of this is on purpose. Um, there mm -hmm. is nothing here that is by mistake. It has been orchestrated, and it hasn't happened overnight. And that's why it's going to take everybody fighting uh, to ensure that the Voting Rights Act is restored. They've just named this legislation after John Lewis, um, mm -hmm. which is... Um, you know, I don't know if it's an honor because the honor is actually passing it. The House um, of Representatives has, has passed it, but the Senate is just sitting on uh, the desk of the, the Senate Majority Leader right now. So there are things that can absolutely be done. Um, and what the Voting Rights Act being gutted did is just ensure that, um, you know, folks could discriminate against people uh, to ensure that everybody doesn't vote. And you have to ask yourself, right? If voting wasn't important, would people be going through these great lengths to stop you? Right. And that's what that is what's so hurtful to me when I hear people say, Oh, my vote doesn't count, it actually doesn't matter, they're all the same. All all of that crap that that mm -hmm. is like a voter suppression handbook. Spew mm -hmm. all of that information, discourage as many people as possible, and let's see if people actually come out. So a uh, confusion is voter suppression, telling you whether or not you can actually vote by mail or saying vote twice, um, or telling you that you know the Postal Service won't be able to handle it, um, or making sure that you have an exact, sac uh, exact uh, match signature on your mail-in ballot. That's mm -hmm. a form of voter suppression. I don't know about you guys, but I don't ever write my signature the same ever. <laughs> twice, ever, right. Ever. Like, 
who writes signatures anymore anyway when you're doing most of that stuff electronically? Right. So all these little tactics from making sure that like I'm I'm home in Georgia now and I thought, well, if I don't go back to Atlanta, go back to New York, perhaps I'm going to stay here. I might, you know, get a Georgia ID and potentially, you know, be a, a resident here for a while. Um, but I, I won't be able to get registered or vote in Georgia if I don't have a Georgia license. All of these things. And who mm -hmm. knows? to be staying here. So yeah. at the end of the day, there's so there's so many tactics. I don't want to focus on all of those things, but rather I want everybody to make sure that they know their rights. One thing that yes. you can do is you can go to whenweallvote.org, uh, click on our resources. We have a know your rights page. We, we talk about what voter suppression looks like. Those long lines that you all see. Mm places being open um, due to shortage, uh, a shortage on uh, poll workers. We've all worked, all of the coalition of voting organizations have worked really hard to recruit hundreds of thousands of new poll workers, but there's still some places where, where we need more. So mm -hmm. folks can go to Power to the Polls to see some of those cities uh, to yeah. potentially sign up. I know most of you guys are in New York, so that might not work for you, but um, you can reach out to, to friends that you have at other places to encourage them to potentially become poll workers. Another way we try to fight voter suppression is making your plan to vote. Um, mm -hmm. It sneaks up on you. Early voting starts really soon in some places if it hasn't already started. And if you don't make that plan to vote, and make that plan a vote early, then you could fall susceptible to all the tricks of the trade uh, mm -hmm. by either you know not turning your ballot in on time or you're rushing on your ballot so you you misread and you write with blue ink and not black ink. There's little mm -hmm. things like that that you have to pay attention to. So that's why it's so critically important for everybody to take the time to make the plan. And when they make the plan to actually go through it step by step to ensure that they are following all the rules because we don't want anybody tripped up by it. Uh, and an informed voter cannot be suppressed. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of our partners, uh, the Lawyers Committee has an amazing, amazing helpline, seven days a week, lawyers, okay? Over 20,000 lawyers around this country are volunteering their time to talk to you. So if you have a question, it doesn't even have to be, I mean, you could have a question for your mom that lives in another city or state, it doesn't matter. Call that number 1-866-OUR-VOTE uh, and they will help you. They will answer any and every question you may have. Um, and, and if you are at a polling place and somebody tells you, well, you're not on the rolls, don't leave. You stay there. You say you want a provisional ballot. And if you have any trouble, you stay right there. Do not leave and call that hotline immediately and tell them mm -hmm. what's happening. Um, and if you see anything suspicious, I know that they're having robocalls. calls, um, that they're, they're, they're calling uh, seniors, mostly black seniors, telling them there'll be debt collectors at polling places, um, wow. telling them that election day is a different day. There's There are things that are happening to the most vulnerable around us. So that's why it's so critically important for all of us to work, not only just together, but to really pull our family, our friends, our coworkers, everybody together and give them as much information as we can and share all of the resources that we can with them so that we're not leaving anybody behind. With this week, we launched um, our voting squad challenge. Ms. Obama mm -hmm. launched that with her co-chairs, including your sister Rhonda, one of our co-chairs. And the whole premise of being a voting squad, cap, voting in a voting squad rather, is making sure that you're able to help quell all of this noise and nonsense by giving people the resources that you have through when we all vote to make sure that they're making their plan to vote early. So what we like to say um, as we're kind of looking forward to early voting and we've just partnered with um, more than a vote LeBron James's organization is that when we all vote together, we become more than a vote. And mm. that really means that we are becoming a movement and we have to be in this together. And once we know better, once we're better informed, once we have more awareness around what things look like around what voter suppression looks like, um, then we can combat it. And we have to then tell the people in our lives to do the same thing. Oh, awesome. I just feel, I feel empowered just like yeah. listening. Yes, so Rhonda. Good. So good, Stephanie. I want to, I want to jump on a couple of things. Um, yeah. I love that you said an informed voter can't be mm, mm. I love that. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just want to say to it, people listening, exactly what you just said that but that each state is different mm -hmm. in terms of what what is needed blue ink black ink signing outside all that stuff all that is different and so the earlier you do it you have more time to get informed right um and then we've been reading in the in the news about how uh, 
how there's a chance that one of the strategies on the other side is to to uh, choose electors to to just uh, to, to to vote for uh, for 45, no matter what the popular vote is, all of that kind of stuff. If the if the numbers are close enough. And so that's why I think the fact that we all vote, I love that more than a vote, more than a vote, more than one vote, because when we all come together and overwhelm the system with our votes, that's to me, because I, <laughs> excuse me, I've also been reading this, right? <laughs> oh. So, right? So, so that to me is how you, the suppression is in so many areas that you almost can't keep up with all of them. That's right. How do you get past them? You overwhelm it with votes, right? You, mm. you overwhelm it with our presence, where then those tricks don't work anymore. Yeah. And you know, I, I do want to let people know because I think that we're in, we've been probably down in the dumps for a while, but I, I want mm. people to be in, um, at least a little bit inspired and um, excited to know that over 6 million people, almost 7 million people have cast their ballots early in this country, okay? Compared to in 2016, it was only about 400,000 people. So we have surpassed that number by far. I don't know if you guys saw the lines in Georgia this weekend um, when early voting started. It was wrapped around, of course, mm -hmm. it but they, they worked it out. But I mean, people are excited to go vote. And yeah. I, I'm inspired to see that people do realize there is power. Um, the only thing is I want people to realize that you cannot just do it now. You have to continue to stay, mm -hmm. in, the game, stay in the game. Don't leave out because that's what happens. We pile on during a presidential election and then we all like go to sleep uh, during midterms and during other really important critical elections in mm -hmm. your city and in your state. And that's another way that voter suppression can creep in because yeah. you have all these state legislatures uh, who are working day in and day out to figure out, well, how do we make it more complicated uh, to vote in what is supposed to be a leading democracy in the world? And yeah. when we aren't paying attention to what those people are doing in our state houses, um, that's where we fall um, you know, victim. And by the time we look up, it's too late. So that's why voting for each and every office is so critically important. We have something called Ballot Ready in our Voter Resources Hub that you actually can see who's on your ballot ahead of time, do your own mm -hmm. research. We have mm -hmm. links that link out to who those people are. But that's why it's so important for us to vote in each and every election and to make sure that we vote for every office. People usually say down the ballot. I've come to discover a lot of people don't know what down the ballot means. Um, that literally just means every office. Um, and and it's incredibly important to do that so that we can help to prevent um, and put people in place. I believe voting is is should be for everybody and not for the select few. And then if you drive, I, I always, I think about this a lot too, because people want to tap in and then tap out, but nobody goes to school for one day and goes, thank you, I have all the knowledge I need, I'm done. Done with college. My first day, I'm good. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we do when we vote for an, in one election and we tap out. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not graduated. You haven't gained anything. You haven't seen progress. It is a process that you have mm -hmm. to be a part of. Nobody goes to church or a synagogue or the mosque and says, mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you, God. I have all I need from you. I'm done. No, you go every right. Sunday or every Saturday or whenever you're supposed to go. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because it is a process. So civic engagement and voting is that same type of process. You have to put into it to get out of it. And yeah. the moment we don't put into it, especially on the local level, um, we end up where we are right now, where we have a lot of mountains that we have to climb. But I, I want to, I want people to still be encouraged to know that we've already climbed these mountains many mm -hmm. times. Um, yeah. And the blessing, I think, of where we are right now with what we've continued to see in our streets from police violence uh, to civic, uh, civil unrest, uh, yeah. to also a deadly virus that has ravished our land. Literally, it should show and tell us how every office actually really does matter, how every government official matters yeah. in our lives, how they have an impact on our lives, whether we're healthy or whether we are not. It is real. We can all see that. So I hope this is a great awakening that I think that we have needed to hmm. really come to the back to the plate and say, how are we all going to be a part of this team sport, which is democracy? And it is a team sport. It is not mm -hmm. one-sided. And with 47% of Americans voting in 2016, that's only one side determining your future. And that's mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, 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 I love what you said about college and church. And I was thinking about it in terms of um, like budgeting, right? Mm -hmm. so, 
So you 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 skipping all the important little budgeting things throughout your months, uh, your weeks and your months. You know, you're you're not paying attention to uh, uh, how much you're spending on I don't know your lattes or going out to dinner or buying. <laughs> You're not paying attention, none of that, right? And then you turn around and you're about to get evicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now you're about to get evicted. So you take all your little money and you pay your rent. And that to me is the presidential election, right? You go in, you pay your rent, you do what you gotta do, okay. But then the next day you need to start putting your stuff together so that you don't just keep coming up to every four years you're about to get evicted. You know, mm -hmm. every four years you got this huge problem on your hands. Yep. You go deal with you know and so um yeah so it's, it's the same kind of you know it's maintenance right it's it's daily weekly monthly you got to be thinking you know who who are making these choices for me and like you said what we saw during this pandemic is that there are uh, uh, uh offices and people in those offices making critical mm -hmm. critical choices critical. that we don't agree with because we didn't take the time to to vote them in yeah, the ones that 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 agree with where we are, you know, what we want, and share your values. Yeah, my values exactly. I, I really do. Hello. Hey, 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 hey. hey everybody. <laughs> How are you? Thanks for joining. Hey, Chelsea. I'm good. I'm good. You know, we uh, down to the fact y'all were just talking about it. We are in the oh, <laughs> home stretch. I will tell you, I've been a little nervous. I've been on, I've been on, like the internet. I didn't believe um, that black men were repeating some of these talking points until my friends started doing it. And I'm up here, I can't type fast enough. I'm like, he is lying to you. He is lying, lying. No. They're like, oh, they're lying. But they're like, you know, but you know, the Democrats are. I'm like, no, not this time. Not that y'all mm. vote, vote for. So, so it's been interesting as we come into the final weeks. Um, but happy to be here. Oh, I'm so you know your your timing was just excellent. <laughs> um, we're moving into a different part of the conversation, so it's great to have you here, Duray. Um, and am I pronouncing it right, Duray? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, sometimes I like say people's names wrong, and, and I'm, I'm like saying it like that confidently. Uh, so I do want I do want you to do a little bit of our check in, which is what we did earlier, just so that folks who are unfamiliar with your work can get a little bit acclimated with with who's on the line now. We have we have a new voice in the room. Um, so could you give us your? Let me let me let me um actually just paste it into this into the chat here. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do. I have here your art form, if you would like to talk about your creative endeavors as well. Um, when, how, why, through what way did the political come personal for you? Uh, and the last question is, thinking a lot about Shirley Chisholm's iconic um, campaign slogan for her run for presidency, unbought and unbossed. What does that mean to you uh, politically or personally or both? Yeah. So those are checking questions. Won't take up a lot of time because I'm excited to have this for uh, this this conversation with all of us. But I'm Dre. I'm an activist. Uh, help lead a group called Campaign Zero. Focused. We spend a lot of time on police violence. Like that's our thing uh, because we understand that the police are not ancillary to the issue of mass incarceration, but the police are key to it. That you can name uh, three ways you get to prison or jail that don't include a police officer. So that is like mm. what we do. Uh, when we think about so when I think about like how I became political, it was early when I was a youth organizer as a teenager. But teaching was one of the most powerful things I've ever done. I used to uh, teach sixth grade math and then I opened up an after school center for fifth through eighth graders. Uh, and, and there every single night, every day, I saw the way the systems impacted my kids, their families, that was a big deal for me. It is a reason why I went in the street in Ferguson in the first place was because at the time, I, the kids I taught would have been around the same age as Mike Brown. And that was that was big for me. So that was that was a life changer. And then I'm bought and I'm bossed. Um, you know, I think that so much of this moment has been an awakening for people about controlling their own destiny, about saying like, I can actually usher in the future I deserve. I can like imagine something and fight for it. And all of those things are real. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm always excited about being in conversation with incredible people like this, uh, who are willing to put a stake in the ground about what we know we deserve. Mm, yeah. Um, and that's an awesome segue into the next uh, question that I have, which is, um, and Rhonda, you were just talking before DeRay came on a little bit about, you were giving um, an analogy about eviction, but I, I, I actually would like to talk about what are the pressing issues that you think 
people need to be aware of as they are going in to vote, as we're thinking about this election season, as we're thinking about civic engagement. You know, this is the season to be thinking about that, even though we just discussed the season is all year round, all the time to be engaged in, in these topics. So what, what do you all think is something that we need to be focusing on? Um, and I can start us off and then maybe we go myself and then we'll go Rhonda, Stephanie, and then DeRay. Uh, but something I think that I would like for us to be really talking about is these rent moratoriums. How are we helping folks who are trying to make these, these rent payments during the pandemic? You know, how are we protecting people from becoming houseless? Um, and the numbers of, of evictions are, are continuing to rise, which is like, so there's a lot of grief, which we'll, I think we'll talk about in, in, in a second, but there's a lot of grief for me around that. Yeah. Uh, Rhonda, what do you think? What it, what it, what's on the ballot for you? What's your? I, I don't I don't want to be vague, but literally, I think all of it. Hmm. They all affect me. They all it's affect all... black women. They all affect us as black people. I mean, they do. We talk about intersectionality. They all do. You know how mm -hmm. healthcare. I don't know. Maybe healthcare. I don't know. Wage gap. You know, like, like where do we racism, like police brutality, like you know, like the prison industrial complex, like the yeah. climate change. <laughs> I right. mean, literally, they're all they're all you know, they are all on the when I think about Roe versus Wade, when I, I mean, when right. I think about like one after the other, of it's it's really hard for it's hard for me. It's hard for me to say this one is more important than this one, and they all intersect and they all yeah. connect. You know, if if you're gonna if you're gonna twist my arm and make me say, I would say probably <laughs> probably health care. Okay. And wage, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'm not I'm not holding you to it. Okay. You know, and. Comma, yeah, comma. No, no, they're all there. They're all there. I, 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 I'm the mother of a, of a son. I, I, they're all there. Mm. They're, all there. they're all there. Mm. Yeah. Stephanie, what's what's lo yeah. looming large for you? Yeah. So speaking on my behalf, mm. just me, Stephanie, and by myself, as when we all vote as nonpartisan organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think all. Rhonda said it perfectly, it's all of it. Um, we do have some really urgent needs um, when it comes to ensuring that people in this country have access to adequate and equal health care, um, mm -hmm. considering that we're in a global pandemic. Um, so that's a little urgent. Um, but I, yeah, it's everything. I, I, what I What I would like to say, though, is that I do think, and it's not always us, when I say us, I'm, I'm speaking about us as black people and black women. But when we do go into the voting booth, thinking about people other than yourself, hmm. um, just because you have access to something or if you have, um, you know, opportunity in ways uh, that other people have, you, you can't just vote for yourself. Um, because if I don't do well, you don't do well. So when you do go into that voting booth and you think about issues, you have to think about issues that impact people more than you. You have to mm -hmm. think about issues that are going to impact your children if you don't have them, your future children or your nieces or nephews, somebody's child. OK. Um, and I think that we've become such a selfish country. And I think it's mm -hmm. so important to stop thinking about yourself and think about other people in other neighborhoods yeah. who may not have the access and opportunity that you have. And who are those elected officials that will go into office and think about more than just you? Hmm. And I so incredibly important that we that we start to take not all of us right that many many americans start to take that <laughs> philosophy forward and they're thinking about other people when they go into that ballot box because it is so, or that about that booth because it's so incredibly important um and everybody is impacted by the way in which you vote um mm -hmm. so it's it's uh thinking about uh folks other than yourself i i, I would be remiss if if you know didn't mention climate change considering 
all of the devastation with the fires yep. that we've seen in uh, California, and then you have the continual um, ramping up of hurricane after hurricane after hurricane. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just, it's really just not a joke. And it's not about, do you believe in climate change? We need to completely get rid of that phrase and that mm -hmm. question from our, from our vocabulary. Like that doesn't make any sense. There, it's mm -hmm. not, do you believe, do you believe in light? Do you believe in dark? Do you believe in day and night? Come on. Like climate change is real. So I think mm -hmm. that, that we all have to, to make sure that that is top on our list as well as we're thinking about things, thinking about these things, because we are literally seeing the world change right in front of us. I don't know how hot it is in California, but Rhonda started out outside. And I know that it's been, my sister lives in LA and it's been very, very hot in oh. October. Yeah. So yeah. it's not a, it's not a joke. Um, and yeah. of course, criminal justice reform. I got the the privilege to to meet Duray because of all the work that he did, um, mm -hmm. and it's still doing on criminal justice reform. Um, when I worked at the White House, um, mm -hmm. I still remember the first time meeting him. I can't believe you don't have him in your vest. I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> it's climate um, like, change. It's too hot to wear the vest inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, but. I think about all of those people. I think about my cousins who are incarcerated right now. I think mm -hmm. about the people in all of our lives that we know. So many people have been in, have been touched uh, by the criminal justice system. We all have in some way, shape or form. Uh, and the more time people spend away from society, the worse it is for all of us um, in a multitude of different ways. And the, the more lives we're ruining, the more communities we're ruining, the more city, cities we're ruining. I just, there's so many urgent needs. Um, people shouldn't get overwhelmed, but um, those are those are things that, that come to me first. Yeah, wow, thank you, thank you. DeRay, what's, uh, what's, what's looming large for you? Yeah, so I spend most of my time trying to help people uh, understand the impact that the system's already having on them. So, you know, I'm in a lot of places now where people are like, well, I don't do politics. I'm like, politics is doing you, right? So uh, when mm -hmm. we think a system, it is a reminder that there are people that we chose who are making the decision. So when you think about that 20 year sentence that person got for drugs, it was a judge who was probably elected who like started that path, right? When you think about your kid's classroom that doesn't have textbooks, it was probably like a school board that didn't have enough money because the legislature didn't get, like making that connection with people, like that's actually what I think, that's where I see a lot of disconnect is that the system is like this abstract thing to people. And then elections are sort of like another abstract thing to people and the mm -hmm. people don't get that it's like people made these decisions people did it people mm -hmm. incarcerated your cousin people underfunded your school system people didn't fix the potholes in your neighborhood like people yeah. that you have the power to choose they did that mm -hmm. and like so when you say like you're not in politics it's like no no, no. politics is all up through all your stuff so mm -hmm. like that's a lot of time and then obviously the police you know the police it's weird. I think this moment is sort of oddly celebratory. The police have actually killed more people this year than last year. No dip, no decrease. The police are sort of unchanged. Uh, and I don't know if you know that if you looked at all the magazine covers and all these sort of celebratory things. I'm like, eh, the police are police are winning. Um, so the mm. police issue is like really big to me because almost all of it is local. Mm. And the same with mass incarceration. You know, 2.2 million people incarcerated. Only 200,000 of those 2.2 million are incarcerated in federal prison. So uh, 2 million of them are actually incarcerated in state and local. And that is like all, that is, they're your people. Those are like your city council people, your mayors, like this is your people, you know? Mm -hmm. I think they're the people locking people up. Even when we think about things like private prisons, uh, less than 8% of prisons are private. The vast majority of prisons are public. It is your governor and your mayor mm -hmm. allowing uh, exploitation to happen in all these places. It's not some random company as people would like you to believe. So uh, that's where I spent a lot of time, like helping people realize that like this terror is actually uh, really close and the decision making is actually really close. And if there's anything to take away from this administration, which is like, whew, give me, I know, I know um, Stephanie is nonpartisan. <laughs> <don't know. laughs> She's nonpartisan one for all us. Uh, <laughs> When I, when I think about it, it is like what we did learn over four years is how fast the government can move if it wants to. Like who thought you could like rip up mailboxes out the street? I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I like that to me, like would have to take forever, but it was like, apparently not. You could just throw the sorting machines in the trash can. You could ban countries on Twitter. Like I didn't even know the government, like it's such a big apparatus and I thought it just like moved a little slower. Apparently it doesn't, right? So part mm -hmm. of that is also reminding people that 
you can put people in office to demand the big things. And if we can do all that horrific stuff, then we can definitely use the power and speed and might of the government for good. We can mm. guarantee housing. We can guarantee health care. Like we can actually do all this stuff and we can do it in our lifetime. Like I don't ever think that I'm fighting for like a 200 year thing. I think I'm going to be 90 and be like, who's Steph? You remember that meeting? In the White House? <laughs> Police was killing people. God, it was hard. You know, like that's what I uh, feel really hopeful. Ah, yeah, and that's just a, such a beautiful transition into what I wanted to talk about next is like, what are y'all learning about resilience watching all of this happen? What do you learn? What what is what is giving you hope? We talked earlier about 2020 being the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment and how long of a fight. I mean, there were there were suffragists who were campaigning their whole lifetime and didn't see the vote by the time that they that they passed. And so I'm constantly asking folks who come on MBT at home because I'm so personally wanting to know, you know, where are you finding hope and where are you, what is, what is keeping your spirit um, fueled at this moment? Rhonda, do you mind if we start with you? <laughs> I'm like, hot, hot seat. <laughs> Summer 2020, want to get the blues? <laughs> it started with a lockdown, then from top down, everything got confused. Uh oh, okay. uh oh, uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. George Floyd, you tear mm. gas me on the news. And then in the midst of a pandemic raging, you're trying to put my kid in school. Mm -hmm. It'd be funny, it'd be so funny if it wasn't true. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, uh, uh, resilience, it's so amazing you bring that word up because I talk about that a lot in, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, in, in the public speaking I do. Uh, I talk about resilience. Um, uh, I think it goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of this talk, which has to do with healing, um, self-love, um, self-care, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and knowing I love what DeRay just said, you know, being optimistic, even when, when you don't necessarily see the, uh, uh, all, the, all, the, all the proof of it. I think optimism and peace and joy uh, come from something bigger than proof. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it comes from keeping your eye on the wise, right? It comes from something else. And, um, and for me, uh, uh, one of the things that I've done during this time, I got really clear uh, about what my work is as an artist, um, as an artist activist. I, I call myself also a social artist that, that I need to be making work. I need to be telling the stories. I need to be writing my songs. I need to be doing that because that is my way. That's my version of self-care. And that's my version of keeping myself healed and well and focused and unafraid and optimistic. And uh, so that's one of the, that was a piece of one of something I wrote during this time, just because it helps me kind of hold it together, you know? Um, and so that's what I that's 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 what I do to stay resilient. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I talk a lot about um, and also how I parent to allow the bumps in the roads to to be the bumps in the road, but know that something inside of me has a shock absorber that I can mm -hmm. I, I can the the bumps don't need to the bumps will change, but the bumps don't need to change right this. Second, I'm gonna I'm gonna shock absorb so I can keep driving where I need to go, you know. Yes. And so that's I think it's about self care, self love, and um and and staying staying healed and staying focused. Yeah. And what What are some things that you do to practice self care? I think like I I do daily walks. I have I have to take a walk once a day. Be, what do you outside, What are you doing? Being outside is huge for me. Huge. Mm -hmm. I, as, as you saw how I started, the, <laughs> the way mm -hmm. I started outside and I had a technical issue, I came inside. But um, but yeah, being outside is huge for me. Um, mm -hmm. I get my rest at night, I go to sleep, uh, mm -hmm. I get my hours, um, I eat well, I drink a lot of water. Um, but, but, but separate from that, um, I'm a meditator, I'm a journaler. Mm -hmm. uh, I get up early, my son gets up about eight, nine o'clock. I'm up at five so that I can mm -hmm. have 
those out every morning so I can have those hours that are mine. I journal, I write my songs, I, 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 I meditate. I listen to a lot of um, uh, a spiritual self-help type of personal growth stuff. Um, mm. I, I listen to it, I write it. Um, so I do that and I get outside every day and I drink my water and I go to sleep. Thank you. I mean, and, and, and I ask about the specifics of what are your practices because something that I, I'm very much interested in is how are we sharing ways of sustainability? How are we sharing ways of survival with each other? Yeah. Um, Stephanie, do you want to speak to, I, I, oh yeah, Rhonda, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. I just yeah. want to, and I, and I, I don't watch a lot of television. I, I, I watch very little television, uh, mm -hmm. mostly because it's, it's too, <laughs> it, they're throwing too much at me. Yeah, yeah, they're throwing too much at me and, and too, I can't, I can't decipher it quickly enough and I get overwhelmed by it. Um, that, that be, that's the television news. I also don't watch a lot of other television mostly because I got too much to do. But, um, <laughs> but, but staying informed cools me out. So as you can see, I read a lot um, and, uh, and I research a lot. Um, and, and so, I, so I'm always learning, 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 learning. Uh, that in the midst of everything else I just said, that helps a lot, but not having uh, something talking at me all the time that I can't control. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Stephanie, what are you doing to keep sane? Really yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, I'm working. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm right now. I kind of feel like um, I did when I worked on the Obama campaign in 2012. And I remember for 17 weeks straight, we worked seven days a week at, towards the end. Uh, and I remember oh. I, I just put my hair in the same ponytail every single day. And <laughs> um, just. <laughs> So that that is that might be a form of my resilience actually. I'm, now I'm now I'm kind of thinking about it a little bit more. Um, mm. It's hard for me because I when I left the Obama administration at the end uh, in January of 2017, I went and worked in corporate America for a couple of years, literally just like two or a year and a half. Um, and I was unfulfilled um, in what I was doing during corporate communications, uh, worked at two major television networks and just decided this is not something I really wanted to do, especially when Mrs. Obama started this organization in 2018. And I, I did get called over. Um, I was not running necessarily, but I knew that I wasn't fulfilled by what I was doing and I needed to do something more. And for me, what gets me through all of the moments um, is knowing that I'm doing the work. Um, and is knowing that I am through my work, through my personal sacrifice of not, I mean, nobody's really hanging out, but I legitimately mm -hmm. don't have a real life right now. Um, mm -hmm. but being able to sacrifice those things, um, mm -hmm. and knowing that I'm in the game in a way if that, if that makes sense. Um, it's mm -hmm. important for me to feel like I'm doing the work now, obviously I'm a human and we're all human. We all have to, to have balance in our lives. So with, you know, similar to Rhonda, um, I love the, um, and I'm, I always mess up the name, but it's a meditation app um, on Headspace? Apple. What's it called? Headspace? No, not, no. That's, that's oh, there. No, not the Calm app. The Calm app. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. That's there. The all of them. We need all the apps. <laughs> I don't do, I don't do Headspace. I have a real therapist that I do talk to that I like completely forget. I'm like, oops, my therapy time. But <laughs> Yeah. Therapy is also um, uh, something that's been super helpful for me um, during this period. And at the top of 2019 in January, I lost my father. So like, there's like, this is the last two years have just been terrible. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, I've had to do everything that I can to make sure that I'm in a good, good space. Uh, and since I'm home, I have a, I have my nephews are 10 minutes down the road. One of them is four years old. So they the four year old anytime, but like, these kids don't care about anything going. I mean, he knows about coronavirus, trust me, but oh, yeah. they are able to be resilient in a way that a lot of us um, aren't able to, but escape with them and, and to be in the moment with, with children, I think is so incredibly important, especially if you don't have your own yet. Um, so those are, those are some of the things I'll say some, I do want to touch on what has given me hope though. Um, mm -hmm. And what I what I've loved about campaigns in my life is that you, you're working so hard, 24 hours all the time, just completely focused on work, immersed in work, right? And then 
you know, you sometimes get disillusioned, like, am I making a difference? This is really working. Then you go to a rally and then you see like, I mean, I use, you see President Obama speak and everybody is like flipping out and I'm flipping out too. And like, it kind of gives you that energy, but COVID has taken that away. So you can't have that moment where you're really touching real people and you see how they're impacted by the work that you're doing. But we have these amazing volunteers called Voting Squad Captains. We have almost 50,000 mm -hmm. of them all around this country who have signed up to um, really engage in their community and get their communities organized and to see them virtually on calls, telling us where they're from, all the things that they're doing, how excited they are to see all of that energy that they're bringing. Um, I just feel like, I, I really do feel like things are shifting. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel a sense of, uh, people trying now to take more responsibility for their lives and for the future of this country uh, by stepping up. Just all of the rainbow of people that we saw in the streets all over this country gave me hope. Seeing people dance in the streets uh, during this moment has given me hope. And I, I, regardless of what's happening right now today, there's a disaster every day, but I, I can I can literally feel that energy from the people, um, which gives me, a, gives me more hope and a better sense mm. of and then to see the synergy from people all over this world standing oh, up for yeah. our lives uh, in a way that we've just never ever seen before. People are standing in solidarity with us in mm. every corner of the earth. That is that is magnificent, and we shouldn't shy away from from feeling um, some good energy from that as well. So there's a lot of things that we can all be grateful for, and it's not all lost. And what Duray said, um, mm. you know true. It, it doesn't take a lot of time to unravel things. It does take a lot of time to pull things together. And mm. the government can't, is like a, it's like a cruise ship. You don't, you can't completely turn around, but you can sink it pretty fast. Oh, that's a good, that's a, that's a good that's analogy. Good. Yeah. But that, that is, uh, I mean, you can set it on fire <laughs> and just watch it, you know, it, you know, explode, but it is hard to, it is hard to do, I think, you know, some of the things that we do, you know, want to see. And and we would sit in rooms for hours talking about police violence with police in the room, right? With mm. people in the Department of Justice, with with the folks that can and, and, and could make a difference, right? Bringing everybody to the table. And that takes, that takes leadership and that takes work. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stephanie. Ray, what's your... Yes, the only thing I'd add is that, you know, I was... Um... Recently, I was wondering, I was like, why aren't the white people mad about what's going on with some of the police stuff? And like, I was just like, I don't get it. I'm like, y'all are dying too. This guy don't care about, co like, you know, you should be. And I realized that some of what I was doing was actually projecting that, like, there's something really interesting about the way that Black people have always understood community as, like, expansive and as, like, y'all are my sisters. And, and that's like a real, we sort of embody it because we've had to, that, like, we knew that family could never be rooted in legal relationships because we were denied those. We knew that family couldn't be rooted in place because those were ripped up from us. We knew that family couldn't be rooted in like the nuclear space because we were uh, that that like style was actually stripped from us so long ago. So our sense of family has always been expansive. Like our sense of community has always been sort of an expansive thing where like my cousins in Wauwatosa and my like, you know, I feel like they're my brothers and sisters and that, like that that language is not just language, but it is actually how we like live and build because we have always understood that power comes from relationships. It doesn't come from hierarchy, right? Mm. When I think about like sort of the magic of blackness, like that, so when you call it resilience, when I think about like this magic, it is it is because we always know that we are standing with a community much bigger than the people directly mm -hmm. around us. We are mm -hmm. always in solidarity with them. We are fighting for. So when Stephanie talks about you're going into the voting booth, voting for more than you, I'm like, I, you know, I am always thinking about like, God, my great grandmother is not here anymore, but like she would have like it would have been crazy for her to see a world like this and like she did not pick 10 cents uh 10 cents a pound of cotton for me not to like exercise this thing that she didn't have the right to do you know like i am that is like that is heavy on me that is like a real thing and mm -hmm. i think that black in, in sort of black communities our sense of our responsibility to the community is actually uh, just a source of power. I think it's why our music is so rich and why our culture is so rich and why our art is so rich and why our sort of analysis around sort of what works and doesn't is because we always are like a part of something magical that extends far beyond our physical reach. So when I think about how I stay whole um, in moments mm -hmm. like this, 
I, I play in the how we win. Like that is sort of where I play. So in the, in the way that Stephanie is like, I'm busy all the time and don't work. It's like, I'm not dwell, I'm not sitting in the problem. I'm not like repeating the problem back to you every day. I'm, I am wake mm -hmm. up every day, you know, we, it's called campaign zero because we can live in a world that way the police don't kill people. So every day mm -hmm. I'm like waking up trying to like, what's the new way to get to zero? Like no one strategy will get us there. So we know there's no silver bullet. And this question of how do you eat an elephant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, answer one bite at a time, right? But there's a mm -hmm. version of that that says one bite after another, which is incrementalism. We don't believe that. There's another mm -hmm. version though that says everybody's biting at the same time. That this is actually like a full core press. And the mm -hmm. only way we'll win is a full core press. That the institutions we're up against, they'll always win if we do like one thing, um, one thing in January, another thing in July, like institutions will just like pop back. That's what they do. But when you're like, we're gonna take this down and this and replace it with this, and then like all at one time, the full core press is what we have to do. So every day when I wake up, I'm like, what's the next bite? Like, how can we have all these people biting at the same time so we get it? Uh, and the same thing with voting, right? It's like, how do we, we're trying to build a big house. One tool won't do it. So it's like, how do we make sure that people like are quick to use every, they have the tools, they got, everybody got the toolkit, but some of them don't know how to use the wrench. So how do we help you like figure out how to run for office? Some of them don't know how to use a hammer. How do we help you testify before the council, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so, I, so I play in the how, the how is what keeps me sane. Oh. I mean, this this has just been such a fruitful conversation. I mean, so so rich with like strategies and tactics and, and getting down into like the real structures of what of what we can do. And I, you know, I feel very hopeful. I, I feel I feel like I came into the conversation like, oh, this is a this is a heavy 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 conversation today. Like I, I don't really know, but I I feel like I'm very much. Um, I've, some some of the Rhonda, as you say, some of these feelings have been untangled, and I've, I'm able to see them in their wholeness, and I'm able to feel activated and empowered because I feel so informed by the guests that I had on this this evening. I mean, it's really, really, really a gift and really a pleasure. I want to thank everybody, Stephanie. Thank you for coming with the knowledge. Thank you for coming with the strategy. I mean, really, just make really infused me with this like almost Shirley Chisholm energy of like, we're gonna go and we're gonna do this and we are on the path, we are on the trail to go do this. So thank you for joining us, Stephanie, Rhonda. Oh my thank God, you. thank you. Rhonda, thank you for just bringing all of the magic up for your, the song that you sung. I mean, you just have brought such a light and the creativity and artistry to this conversation. DeRay. Thank you for joining us for our, for for our, for our last little bit of this segment. But the bringing such a, such a knowledge and a wealth of insight and wisdom around re resilience and the mechanisms of resilience and how we are going to make it through this moment because we are our own salvation. That is that's what it comes down to. There's an artist who is actually one of our commission artists, uh, Lady Dane Figueroa Edb. She wrote a piece that was actually one of the first pieces that we released, and that is one of the statements that she makes: "Is we are, we are our own salvation." That's that's it. So I want to thank you all for joining me this evening. I'm gonna sign off right now. Don't forget your voter to do today. Vote early, as Stephanie said. Make that voting plan. Know what you what you're gonna go do, where, and there's a there was a lot of resources that we mentioned in this episode about who to call. There's a whole hotline of who to call should anything uh, arise at the polls for you. So do that search for citizenship, and we will see you on October 29th for the final installment of this conversation series. <laughs>